Kim, welcome to my podcast and thank you so much for coming. Thanks very much for having me. It's great to see you and um, we're going to talk today about um, birth trauma and in particular we're going to talk about what people need to know about trauma and also about consent um, which are two really you know um, vital topics I think. So yes definitely. <laughs> tell us a little bit about um, your work and your experience in terms of you know what birth trauma is and and where you're coming from well I, I work for the birth trauma association so um we're a charity that supports uh women who have, who've had a traumatic birth and are suffering psychological symptoms as a result of that um we do also support partners and, and, and dads as well um and and so I, th I think what's interesting about organisations is we're, we're probably the first to kind of um, support that kind of group of people because for a long time it wasn't recognised that birth could be traumatic. You know, there's this, there was this idea that birth was always a joyful experience and therefore you couldn't possibly be traumatised by it. Um, and in fact, in, in the 1990s and early 2000s, there was a kind of shift as professionals started to realise that actually for a lot of women, birth was intensely traumatic. And, and so our charity was set up in 2004 um, in, in in recognition of that and to, to um provide a service to those women who who did feel traumatized by birth and and one of the things you quickly realize is there's an awful lot of women out there who find uh that their experience of birth has left them feeling um immensely distressed um quite often with ptsd um we think they're well the research shows that about four percent of women who give birth go on to develop full-blown PTSD. So that's in so, UK, that's probably about yeah, sorry. For the un uninitiated, um, yeah. tell us about the difference between trauma and PTSD, because what I have heard yes. from women is that there's still a pervading confusion about that, and that women who present sometimes to health professionals with PTSD will get given um medication for antidepressants, or you know, there's a little bit of a sort yes. of blurring of lines between uh postnatal depression birth trauma and PTSD so do you want to just yes yes you're right it, it is difficult <laughs> it is difficult and I think probably we don't help by calling ourselves the birth trauma association in a way because birth trauma is such a kind of broad term really we use the term birth trauma to refer to anybody really who has had a traumatic birth and has experienced psychological symptoms as a result of that um and the thing about PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder is that you have to have a very specific set of symptoms to have a diagnosis. So there are kind of four categories of symptoms, which are um, so intrusive memories, you know, sort of flashbacks, most typically, um, and, you know, anxiety, so that kind of feeling of being very anxious or on high alert, um, avoidance, where you avoid any memories of the trauma or anything that reminds you of the trauma, and then negative cognition, which is quite a broad category that... Um, really refers to kind of feelings of guilt or sadness um, relating to the trauma. But a lot of women after birth might have some of those symptoms, but not all of them. So they don't qualify for PTSD diagnosis. So they might feel intensely anxious, for example, or they might, you know, they might be constantly worrying about their baby or they might avoid going into situations that remind them of the birth, but they're not, they don't qualify for PTSD diagnosis. So we use the term birth trauma to accompany it um, so to cover all those things, because obviously, if you're experiencing any kind of symptoms, really, then you, you, you're in need of support and help. Yeah, um, and when and it comes obviously, to, I was going to say, those are all yeah. all of these things that we're talking about are just labels that we're giving to, you know, what oh, is a absolutely, kind of absolutely, huge yes, variety yeah. of human experiences and emotions and feelings. Yes. And we're just trying to give them labels to sort of in yeah. order to find roots of help. But in in other ways, sometimes those labels can be unhelpful because they yeah. make some people maybe feel like, oh, I don't fit all these criteria, therefore I, I'm not officially, you know, struggling. Mm. <laughs> yes. Oh, absolutely. I, I can. I, I agree completely. You know, this idea of PTSD. I mean, in, in a way, it's a human invention in the sense that you, it, it's almost arbitrary to me that you decide which symptoms qualify for a particular diagnosis and a diagnostic category and which ones don't. Because if you're feeling distressed and unhappy and it's affecting your ability to live your life normally then, then then you need support it doesn't really matter what you call it you still you still need that support 
Um, and I, think, I mean, you asked about postnatal depression and quite often after a traumatic birth, women do experience postnatal depression as well. Again, that's just another label that, that we give, really. Um, but there's often an overlap as well. A lot, But I, th I think it's something like half of women who qualify for PTSD diagnosis also qualify for postnatal depression diagnosis. And, and one of the things we find is that GPs who are not really... Um, aware of PTSD um, postnatally or don't understand about trauma will often misdiagnose women's symptoms as depression um, when actually they're, they're trauma symptoms. And that, it, it, that can be quite difficult because women quite often say to us, oh, I, I knew I wasn't depressed. It didn't feel like depression. It was something else, but they didn't know what it was. And, and it turns out that, that what they have is it, as, as symptoms of being traumatised. Yeah, and antidepressants are unlikely to help you in that situation. Yes, exactly. Yes, antidepressants are not what you need in that situation. No. So coming to another label, mm. birth trauma itself, um, what do we mean mm. by birth trauma? I know that's a difficult so, question. <laughs> yes, it, 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 is a, it is a difficult one. And and so we we tend to kind of adopt quite a broad definition, really, which is we say if a woman feels distressed and traumatised by birth, then that then she has birth trauma. So if she had a traumatic birth experience um, and, and, and she feels she suffered as a result of that experience, then we, we, we use the term birth trauma. And I suppose the thing I would say is that any birth can be traumatic. So we don't kind of say you can only have birth trauma if you thought you were going to die, you know, or if you had an emergency cesarean. Sometimes what looks like a straightforward birth from the outside can be traumatic for the woman for a variety of reasons and so if she feels traumatized then yeah as far as we're concerned then then that's birth trauma yeah I think I phrased that question the wrong way around with my my pre-coffee brain but I think what I meant was what do we mean by not by by birth trauma but by traumatic birth so uh oh, know, by traumatic birth yeah, so yes that yes, I mean, yes saying that question back no <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah so I I I I mean I think you know birth can be traumatic for all sorts of reasons um and and they're often to do with something going wrong that, yeah, that results, for example, um, in an emergency cesarean or it, say, um, you know, the, the baby has shoulder dystocia and has to be, be delivered very fast. And that's often very traumatic or forceps birth, all those things, postpartum hemorrhage. Um, I mean, there's a range of things, really, but it, it, it's more to do with how the woman feels about the experience than what the experience itself was. Um and and I think one of the most common things for us is the, 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 there's the combination of, of something going wrong during the birth, but it's more to do with how she felt she was treated by staff. And, and that's a kind of really common theme is that kind of feeling of not being cared for properly. Um, something was going wrong, but nobody was telling her what was happening or staff weren't listening to her or they were performing procedures without her consent so the whole process feels as if she isn't an agent in, in what is happening to her and uh, and that's actually quite a well-known cause of trauma um generally not not just in birth um when, when it, it, it's very interesting that ptsd is much more common amongst people who have had a traumatic experience caused by another human being than by a trauma that was just um random for example i, I mean for example, That's if you've survived an earthquake, you're less like it is really interesting. It's about you, you, you're much more likely to um, have PTSD if you've been raped, for example, than if, say, you've been through an earthquake, um, which sounds which, which might sound odd, but actually it's that kind of you know that that kind of interpersonal feeling that you've been. Um, harmed by another human being um because as a society we're, we're built on trust we need to trust other human beings and it's the kind of loss of that trust and that kind of breaking of the social bond between other people that becomes in, in, intensely traumatic and and on that note um there are women who have birth trauma who if you looked at their birth on paper it wouldn't sound traumatic it would sound like mm. everything went that just as they wished it yeah. to go so what's yes. happening there with those could you talk about a bit about those women? It, it's quite often that they, although it seems fine from the outside for the woman, it wasn't what she was expecting, and there were things that happened that felt out of her control. 
Um, I mean, what one one of the things we find is that sometimes very short labours can be really traumatic because they, they happen so fast that the woman feels she doesn't know she doesn't know what's going on. She's completely out of control of her body. You know, she's been taken over by an, an, another force in a way. She doesn't have time to kind of think about it. It, 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 it just sort of happens. And, and it's kind of made worse because people all say, oh, well, you know, you were lucky you had such yeah. a short labour. And for the woman, it was a really, really difficult experience. Um, but often it's that kind of sense of not knowing what's going on, um, having things done to you without your consent, um, not being told what's happening and not being listened to. Those are the sort of themes that come up time and time again. So that even if the birth feels or appears to be straightforward from the outside, that actually for the woman, she's felt completely as if she's she's not been in control of that experience. Is is consent a, a key um, word in yes, the it, do? Yes, it is, yes, and that comes up all the time. It, it it never fails to surprise me the extent to which women have procedures performed on them without consent during labour. Um, vaginal examinations, for example, sometimes water's being broken without their consent. Um, or then sort of feeling kind of coerced into kind of particular interventions, you know, for example, like a cesarean, maybe even, um, you know, being told, well, you have to have an epidural, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, sometimes the opposite as well, being denied, denied, being denied procedures that you want, that can be traumatic as well. But it's that kind of sense of now we're going to do this or now I'm going to give you a vaginal examination. And there's no kind of, I think... It would help to, to, you know, perform a vaginal examination at this stage. Do you mind? And um, a lot of the time that just doesn't happen. You know, it's just no. it's just done. I found it extraordinary in the pandemic how, um, you know, it was quite quickly set up that women, in order to have their partners with them in um, when they were in labour, women had to have a vaginal exam to assess their dilation. Mm -hmm. And most women kind of accepted that and obviously it was the pandemic and everyone was doing their best you know women were doing their best to get through the situation midwives were doing their best health professionals were doing their best but there's something it says something about the kind of bedrock of what we've got what we've built the sort of ideological bedrock that maternity services are built on that it was so readily accepted that fingers could go into into a woman's most one of the most intimate parts of her body in mm. order for her to gain uh, the thing that she needed the most in labour and that that was deemed to be okay and acceptable and, and consenting. It's like coercion, lights are just flashing, yes. you know, it's just like, what? <laughs> well, that's right. If you're going to be denied something, if you don't consent, then it's it's not consent, is it? It's not, it, it is no. coercion. Um, yeah. And I, I remember one of the, you know, we've recently issued some training videos and one of the women on one of the training videos, Davina, talks about having three births and the first two births were traumatic and for the third birth she felt much better informed she's kind of ed educated herself about her rights and she said it had never occurred to her that she could say no um, and for example her first birth a bunch of medical students in the room and nobody said to her yeah do you mind if you have medical students and she, she hadn't realized that she could say no at any point to what was being done to her and, and she went into her third birth feeling a lot better because she knew she could she could say no um there's, there's something about the experience of maternity that, that and i've tried to analyze this in my book that sets it apart from you know it kind of seems like it's like dark ages stuff as if yes. feminism have never had never been invented where you've got women yeah. who are kind of like 21st century women who in other areas of their lives would, would understand about boundaries and consent hopefully not everybody but generally speaking we've we've, we've learned a bit about that as as human beings and and yet you put them into this maternity situation and they've got a room full of people and they, they don't know that they can say, I don't want these people in my space. It's, mm. it's really interesting, isn't it? How we just, it, we seem, I think it's got something to do with that motherhood and sacrifice thing that everything's okay in this situation because it's, you know, the, the baby's got to be got out health, healthy and yes. I've got to set aside everything that I need and everything that feels right or wrong to me in order for that to happen. Yes. And I think, I think there are a couple of things going on as well. I mean, one is that you're really vulnerable in, in, in labour. Um, yeah, and you often quite feel quite fearful, you, especially if it's your first birth. You don't know what's going to happen. And, and so you, you want to do everything right. And you trust health professionals. I and mean, I think that's another big thing. You think these people know what they're doing and I've got to do what they tell me. 
it's very hard to challenge people in authority um, like that because as you said you just want you want your baby to be born healthy and you don't want to do anything that's going to upset the apple cart so you just do what you're told and it's it's only afterwards that you think that wasn't quite right why did why did I put up with that it is a little bit of the white coat thing as well isn't it I think I've noticed Mm. it in other situations like on the I've got three children so in the times I've been in children's ward with them for various reasons nothing serious but you know you you have that sort of it's it's quite difficult to sort of say to a doctor you know well I don't agree and I'm not sure I want to do it like that or I want some more time to think because we have this sort of or the Mm. dentist is another good example you know where you just sort of go along with things and then afterwards you walk out and you think why did I let that happen you know (laughs) so I don't think it's totally confined to the maternity experience but that does seem to sort of like bring it out at its worst yeah. It it does definitely it, it it does and it's very it's very paternalistic still I think maternity care even though it's mostly women who are involved in your care there is that attitude very much of the medical professional knows better than you do um, and you should just you know put up and do what you're told yeah that that's I, very prevalent I was reading this really interesting um, piece of research recently um, again and it's, it talks about how health professionals were asked um who's the ultimate decision maker in childbirth and they all agreed it was the woman and then Mm -hmm. in a separate part of the sort of survey they were asked um you know if there's a dangerous situation you know there's danger to the baby who's the you know who gets to decide basically and they said oh no in that situation you can override um the mother's wishes for you know the health and safety of the baby so they had this sort of like um you know cognitive dissonance where they were on the one hand said they supported women's choice um 100 fully no matter what but on the other hand they did actually deep down believe that there were circumstances in which a a woman's choice could be overridden and i think that kind of lies at the heart of a lot of this doesn't it is that you can yes i think to make whatever choices you want as long as they're the right choices (laughs) (laughs) yes i think that's true yes i i think i I think sometimes for health professionals a non-compliant woman can be very very troublesome and they they don't like women always who, who answer back or who stand up for their rights um and and it can be really hard to do that as, as a woman it can be really hard to challenge health professionals and so as we know we hear these stories you know what one that's quite common for example is the midwife didn't believe i was in second stage labor um and and that kind of fascinates me really because then the women women start to doubt themselves, um, mm. and and but because you see the health professional knows what they're doing, and and then and, and then of course there's an emergency because actually the woman is in second stage labour and there's a lot of rushing around and pressing the buttons and 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 and, and, and so on and and then, then the woman kind of doubts herself and say, well, why didn't I speak up for myself more? And and sometimes there's that kind of gaslighting where there'll be a birth debrief and, and they'll say, well, why didn't you? Why didn't you stand up for yourself a bit more? As you know, you, th- you thought you were in second stage labour. Why didn't you? Why weren't you more forceful about it? As if it was her fault that yeah. the midwife had failed to do the job properly. But it's all so. about what it's what underpins it all is this idea of expertise and the fact that women feel that when it comes to childbirth, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to give birth. And a lot mm, of antenatal yes. classes, it sounds a bit cheesy, but they kind of like trying to instill confidence in women that they do have some knowledge already in their bodies. We're not really yes. into embodied knowledge these days, I don't think so much. Maybe maybe that's part of it. Yes, I think so. And I, I, I do think it's difficult because in most situations you do want to trust the health professional. You don't want to, I mean, for example, you wouldn't yeah. want to go and have your appendix out, taken out by a surgeon you didn't trust. There's, there's a lot of implicit trust in the health professional patient relationship, isn't there? So I think I think it's always difficult to, to know at what point do you challenge what the health professional is telling you. I, I, I do think yeah. that's a difficult one. Yes, it is. It is. And I think, I mean, I always say it's not about always challenging all the time what the health profession is saying. It's about knowing that you can, because that that should be underpinning everything. A bit like, um, you know, I use the um, example of consent in the bedroom um, in your sex life. So even if you've been with your partner for 20 years and you've never said no to them, you might, you hopefully have something there that, you know, if you did say no, they wouldn't just keep going anyway so you know you you, even though you're not exercising the right to say no you still know you have it 
Um, and if you didn't think you had it, that would very much affect your relationship. It would be a very different kind of relationship. And I think yes, in maternity that's, care, that's we have that yes. relationship. A lot of women have that relationship with their care providers where they actually don't realise that they have the right to have bodily autonomy and, you know, to say no if they want to. Not that they have to go in all guns blazing, you know, pow, 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 <laughs> you know, I've read Minnie Hill's book and she said, you've got to say no to everything. <laughs> so I'm like, yes. no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you have to say no. I'm saying you should know that you can if you want to. Yes, I think that's really important and that the health professionals understand that as well. I think that's the really important thing, that they have that respect for the woman and they respect her right to say no. Yeah. So we were talking about what everyone needs to know about trauma and consent. Um, so let's talk about what health, what do you think health professionals need to know about consent that perhaps not all of them do or maybe could be refreshed? I think they need to understand that they shouldn't be doing anything that doesn't have consent and, and particularly informed consent. I think I think that's the key thing, that the woman is informed of what her choices are um, and that she isn't told, well, I, I, I sometimes has happened, well, if you don't do this, your baby will die. I mean, we, we've had that in extraordinary sort of situations where, where it's not true, you know. Um, do you want your baby to die? That kind of thing, that kind of, you know, emotional blackmail. Um, and and so that you always ask the woman before you do anything um, to her body, because it is her body after all. And sometimes um, one, one of the things I think I've, I've, I find interesting is with women who have previously been traumatised, um, because we know that well, one in four women have experienced sexual abuse as an adult. And then there are things like childhood sex abuse, domestic abuse and so on. And sometimes previous traumatic childbirth and all, all those things can make going into labour and birth uh, tr traumatic um, simply because you go in feeling fearful. And I think one of the things health professionals don't always realise is that for women in that situation, any kind of touch at all can can be triggering and can cause her to relive that trauma. So it doesn't have to be a vaginal examination. It doesn't have to be anything as intimate as that. I mean, maybe it's just kind of touching her arm. Um or, or touching any part of her body might take her back to the way she was touched by an abuser. So you you, you always have to ask those things. You always have to. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, you, 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 yes, you, 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 you always have to ask those things beforehand. And one of the things I think health professionals don't always realise as well is that a woman's behaviour in labour can um, indicate that she might prove so. so for example sometimes if a woman has had um a traumatic experience in the past she might be very quiet during labor because her abuser will have told her to be quiet when he was abusing her um and i was thinking what well, one woman I, I talked to for one of my books she said the midwife said to her afterwards oh i wish i wish all my women were as quiet as you were because she didn't realise the reason the woman was quiet was because she was being repeatedly raped by her husband and she was just kind of very frightened um, and, and and just kept as still and as quiet as, as she could. So that's something always to be cognizant of, I think, is that, yeah. is that the woman in front of you might have had a previous trauma that is causing her to behave in a certain way during birth and is causing her to be particularly fearful. We talk about trauma informed care and, you know, sometimes there's initiatives set up to teach health professionals about, you know, uh, how those sorts of women who've had traumatic experiences in the past um, might need different treatment and labour. But I sometimes find that a bit, I don't know, I just sort of think, well, surely every woman should be treated with, you know, tenderness and awareness and care rather than sort of trying to work out which ones need it. Don't we just just treat everybody like that? I mean, what you're oh, describing definitely. about what that midwife said, it just seems like really an ignorant thing to say to anybody. To, to praise a woman for being quiet in, you know, is, is a strange thing to say, even if she hasn't got that history. Yes, it, it is. That's right. Yes, it, it, it is a strange thing to say when you think about it. Um, because why sh <laughs> why shouldn't a woman make a noise doing labour? It, it, yeah. it just seems extraordinary, really. It's, it's quite a normal thing to do. Um but yeah, I, I agree with you completely. You, you shouldn't have to treat uh, traumatised women differently because you you should treat all women with respect and dignity in labour. You should always ask every woman if she minds being touched, for example. You should always be considerate and ask her how she's feeling um, and ask her if she minds if you 
um, carry out a particular sort of procedure. I, th- I think, I yes, I, I, I agree. I, th- I think all care should be trauma informed, and I, I suppose, but I suppose sometimes it kind of helps to know if a woman has had a particular trauma beforehand. I mean, for example, I'm thinking again, a woman, a woman who talks this far training videos, um, Rachel, she'd had an extremely traumatic first birth, um, which had resulted in a category one uh, C-section to save save the baby's life. And the, she was fortunate enough to be with a hospital who were very, very good. And she went to meet them again before she got pregnant again. Um, and then and, and the and throughout the pregnancy, they supported her in in particular ways and gave her psychological help to prepare her for the birth. Um, and everybody who was part of that team delivering the baby the second time knew of her previous history and was very concerned to make sure that she was okay and explain everything that was happening. So, I, I think I think it can help. But I mean, you know, I, I, I agree with you uh, about the broad principle that that all care should be trauma informed. Yeah. So if if someone's listening to this who is pregnant, um, maybe for the first time, um, I, I, I sometimes find when we talk about birth trauma, we, we do often repeat the message that it's the care you receive that makes all the difference. But mm. then I think for, for pregnant women, that can perhaps even with a feeling of powerlessness, because how do they prevent their own trauma from happening? How do they, what, is, there, is there anything they can do to guard themselves against a traumatic birth or you know what would you what would you say to that I I agree it is really difficult because you don't want to give that message to women do you You don't want to say well you're going to go into birth and you're going to be treated really badly and everybody's going to ignore (laughs) you especially in the current situation where we know that the services are underfunded and there's a shortage of midwives and you know that you know it's all a bit overstretched I mean, I, th- I think what you, you said earlier was why I was kind of going knowing your rights and knowing that you can say no and you don't have to agree um, with everything that is put to you. Um, that, that's, that's it's really important, but also making yourself as well informed as possible so that you know those choices you are making are, are informed choices. Um, and, and going, knowing the kind of questions you could ask as well of the health professional when you're trying to make a decision. Um, and, and I would say as well, if you've got somebody with you who can advocate for you, that's that's really, really important. You know, whether it's your male partner or your female partner or your mum or whoever it is. And and for a lot of women, that really makes a difference, having somebody who can advocate. And, and conversely, if their partner hasn't advocated for them, that can be a huge kind of focus of the trauma afterwards, feeling you've been let down um, by somebody you trusted. So I think those... Yeah, I think those are the big things. I mean, is there anything you would add to that? Because I know this is your kind of area of expertise, really. Well, not as much, not as much as you. But I, mean, <laughs> I, I would definitely sort of. I think if I wanted to add to, to it, I'd say about birth plans because I always feel like they get such a bad press, you know, um, in in terms of women being told how pointless they are and how they should just go with the flow. And I always think, oh, whenever I hear a woman being told that, I think, oh, please don't go with the flow because. You know, that's again, it's part of that, that that feeling of being out of control that can lead to feeling traumatized. And you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is that if you've if you've got some um, confidence yourself from the preparation that you've done, then you, that could mitigate against that in some way. And I think birth planning, you know, rather than the sort of the idea of it is like, oh, this silly woman with her laminated thing, or she's written it all in a in marble on a rock, and she's come in and she said, "This is what I want." For me, that's not what birth planning is really about. It's more about the process of getting informed and about thinking, you know, about the different forks in the road. And if it's so, say I have to have this, what then what do I want to happen? And all of that sort of like the same kind of way that you would plan an event. You know, you might think, well, we're all going to go out on the lawn and have champagne. But, you know, what, what if it rains? You know, you think about all the different situations um, in, in any other area of your life. You would think through what you wanted. And uh, for me, I think that's got to be a helpful thing to do in the current system I, I think I think that's right and I remember sort of talking to a midwife from um Magnolia Midwives who is a unit in at North Middlesex unit who specialise in, in trauma informed care you know they have a lot of women coming to them with previous trauma you know refugees and so on and she says that they go through the birth plan in great detail with women and but they all have a kind of birth plan A and birth plan B and some has a birth plan C as well because you have to bear in mind that things don't always go to plan uh, during birth 
Yeah. And I, th- I think that's quite reassuring if you've got a midwife who'll do that, who'll talk through those options with you. I, I, one of the most dispiriting things you hear is that you know, is when women say, well, they didn't look at my birth plan. And uh, yeah, she's gone to all that effort to make a plan and then the midwives or obstetricians haven't, haven't read it. Yeah, there's a long uh, way to go on that one, I think, mm, um, in terms yes, of attitudes yes. towards, you know, women saying what they want in birth and that sort of how that disrupts the power dynamic. Um, yes. and perhaps in the same way that having a doula does as well and all of these things that get the, the mickey taken out of them like birth plans and doulas mm. are usually the things that disrupt the power dynamic I think so there's a reason why they can yes <laughs> yes I agree yeah. yes yes Agreed. but yes. um just um moving on to the other side of the coin so for women who have experienced a traumatic birth who might be listening to this um what can they do I think I think if they experienced oh what if they experienced traumatic birth and they want support not yeah, not if they're mean, going what's... into uh, yeah well I suppose I'm thinking yes. of two things I'm thinking of for me I'm thinking mm. of what where can they get support but also another thing that I'm quite passionate about is complaining so I wanted to mm, yes yes <laughs> okay yeah sure so in terms of getting support well obviously they can come to us the birth trauma association um we've got a team of peer supporters who answer emails and uh and as, as the phone as well um they've all had traumatic birth all been through their own recovery so they're very good and we've got a facebook group uh that has thousands of members where you can share your story and obviously being heard i think is an important part of recovery from trauma but we'd also say um if this is affecting your your daily life then um have therapy um and your gp should be able to refer you to a therapist um, and, you know, there are two treatments that work really well. One is trauma-focused CBT and the other is EMDR, eye movement uh, desensitization and reprocessing. And, and they actually, they're very intensive treatments, but they do work really well and they really do help women recover from trauma. And in terms of complaining, yeah, I definitely say go for it. Um, it can be frustrating sometimes because sometimes hospitals will minimise uh, the trauma they've caused. Um, but I think if you don't complain, then you don't... You, you know you're never going to affect change so I think it is always worth complaining um and go to the hospital website and read up on the complaints process there and then write your letter I, I, I would quite often suggest if you can write indirectly to the CEO rather than going through pals um because it's just more effective actually to go to the person at the top than it is to go uh, go through the pals process what about time uh, limits around uh, complaining um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, in a, a lot of hospitals will say you should complain, you need to complain within a year. Um, but in practice, uh, in practice, they will often take complaints after uh, after the year has passed. Because actually during that first year, you, you might not have the time to complain. You might not have processed your trauma and you're looking after a new baby. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're exhausted. Who's got the time to sit down and write a complaint letter? So, um there shouldn't really be a cutoff point, should there? At, at which no. point a hospital says, we don't want your feedback anymore about this thing that happened two years ago or three years ago. Because even if it can't be dealt with through some kind of, you know, official process, it still ought to be heard and read and responded to, is my feeling. Oh, absolutely, yes. And I, I think most hospitals will actually consider complaints after the year has passed. I think most will do, even though they say it needs to be within a year. Um, yeah. But I, I, it's definitely worth doing. Yeah. hopefully those complaints can you know the more women that actually raise their voice and say this happened and you know and explain why it, you know it, it didn't feel right then hopefully that can affect change for future women you'd hope so <laughs> I, I say you hope so because I don't always feel optimistic about it because I sometimes feel it, I mean for, for example with all the kind of investigations we've had like Morgan Bay's Kent Shrewsbury and so on but you, you still get the same kind of mistakes happening in maternity care and women still t- being treated very badly but i think i think the only way we can keep change the only way we can affect change really is to kind of keep complaining and keep campaigning yeah. um, so i, I think the more women you do that the better so yeah i was going to ask you that whether you had it how you felt after such a long time working in this field you know whether you did have any optimism or hope for change and what, what do we need what needs to happen it, it, 
it is hard to feel optimistic sometimes because it sometimes feels as if things are getting worse rather than better. And I think particularly during the pandemic, we saw so many women give birth in very difficult circumstances, often without their partner present. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, as you said, that whole business of having to have a vaginal examination to be admitted uh, in, into, into labour in, in, in hospital, it, it, it's very hard. Um, I... I I, I think eventually things things will change because simply because of the pressure from, from women, um, you know, there will come a point where somebody will realise, I hope, that you, you, you can't go on like this. You can't keep having these kind of investigations that find poor maternity care um, and, and, and that something will change in, in the system. But it is, it is a long, hard slog, I think. Mm. Well, I hope you're right. Um, it's been fantastic talking to you today and um there's so much more we could talk about but you've really informed us with um with your uh knowledge and wisdom on this topic so thank you so much for coming on the podcast and um, thanks very much for inviting me on